Welcome to Digital 360 Summit 2020. We are the premier event for senior executives driving industry digitalization, decentralization, and decarbonization. 2020 edition is a free virtual event via Zoom. The dates are August 18th, 19th, and 20th, 2020, and August 25th, 26th, 27th, 2020. We want to thank our sponsors, Texas State University, Greater San Marcos Partnership, and Cedar. This year's edition has 70 speakers from amazing companies like NASA, Intel, SAP, CPS Energy, Brazos River Authority, Gatera, Direct Energy, City of Austin, Eclara, Dell, NG, Exelon, Oracle, Testra, General Motors, TXDOT, Bistra, Siemens, AT&T, National Grid, iTron, City of Los Angeles, Austin Energy, City of Colorado Springs, and Hunt Energy Network, and over 1,000 attendees. The program has 16 keynotes and 11 panels, followed by 11 white papers and 28 videos. The event covers multiple industry verticals, verticals like networks, energy and utilities, buildings and infrastructure, water and wastewater, public safety and new financial tools, smart cities, sensor and edge computing, big data and software, smart mobility, new regulations and business models, space and smart factory and industry 4.0. We are also introducing Texas State Cedar, a new industry research consortium focused on connected infrastructure research enabling big ideas and the topics covered in each of the panels. We at Texas State, Star Park, Cedar, the Greater San Marcos Partnership, and industry partners are focusing on building nine living labs to transform applied research and economic development with the goal to delivering one digital world. Welcome, welcome. It's exciting. We're finally reaching the last day of the Digital 360 Summit, day six, and you are in the right place. This is the new regulations and new business models keynote in panel session. We have an illustrious uh, set of speakers, experts from all over the corners of the United States, and they'll, you'll get to meet them in a moment. So before I introduce our keynote speaker, I do want to share uh, a Cedar video that was teed up in the prior video uh, as we were explaining what the, the 360 Summit is. So again, thank you for being here. Let me run that video real quick so that uh, we can, um, let me see here, lost my place, found my place, there's my video. Hopefully you can see that. I'm going to make it big. And please uh, turn up your volume so you can hear it. It's a quiet video. Thank you again for being here. Uh, if you want anything to know more about Cedar, feel free to shoot me a chat or a question or an email. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our keynote speaker, an old friend, a superstar in the industry, like all the other panelists as well. Uh, he's a great guy. He's a former executive vice president for regulatory affairs at Direct Energy slash Centrica, uh, Houston, uh today is uh, his place of home jim how are you i'm well andreas how are you today fantastic you know you 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 have had a phenomenal career working for companies uh, like nrg and others and so we are looking forward to your insights uh and so the 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 show is all yours uh as i promise i would uh run the slides for you and you can tell me to go next and uh here we go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Again, uh, thank you, Andreas, and I'm looking forward today to really um, what a great panel we have, Laura and Eric and, and Suzanne and John, myself, Tom Rose, who's been a, a real leader in the industry. 
uh, on these questions about new regulations and new business models. And as I th sort of think about this, the future of the utility, um, you know, just to start, let me say, I think there's a very bright future for the right utility in the future. And I, I see that the, the utility future is both a platform and a partner for customers and other businesses to succeed as we move down this rapidly transitioning and transforming industry. So with further ado, let's just jump into it. Go next. So I'm gonna just briefly set what I think is the context. We'll talk a little bit about what forces are disrupting or uh, revolutionizing this industry. And then I'll give you a closing thought before we jump into the panel to talk about what I think is uh, the right direction forward for the utilities in the electric sector. Next slide on. So I think this is, um, many of you will know this, you may have read this when you were younger, maybe recently, um, sort of the, the, the context of where we are. This is um, Alice talking, come, it's please so far. Would you tell me please which way I have to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, says the cat. And I think my view in terms of where we want to go is a consumer driven, cleaner, smarter, and more affordable future. Next slide. So what, what's going on? I think over the next 30 years, we are fundamentally changing the energy system. And I, I say that broadly, the energy system, not just the utilities, but the energy system is fundamentally changing. That change is driven by climate and concerns about the climate. We just lived through a, a, a super hurricane coming through Louisiana. Uh, consumers, technology, and data. And um, energy companies, including and especially utilities, are being asked by their customers and by policymakers that oversee them to go faster and do better. Next slide. If you've never sort of looked at sort of the energy industry, I think this is a very interesting slide and you can find us at, at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. This is a chart that outlines sort of the energy flows. And I'm gonna highlight a couple numbers here that I think are relevant. First, look at the, um, at the top, 2018 numbers. And I use 2018 because you can also get state level data here if you wanna go into it. But 101 quad, quadrillion BTUs of energy necessary to power the U.S. economy, a $20 trillion economy back then. A couple of the numbers that are relevant, I think, for the conversations we think about this, and, I, and this is, again, a really interesting way to look, but first look at the top left, the yellow. It's, it's about a quadrillion BTUs of solar, which against that 100, still a relatively small number. The other numbers that I take, if you look at natural gas, 31 quads of energy, but 11 run into the electricity sector. Below that, still today, 13 quads of coal back in 2018, 12 of that still runs the electricity sector. As we talk about decarbonization, remember, those are the two big sources of sort of fossil fired um, power plants that we're dealing with. And the final number I throw out, that bottom, that dark green is petroleum. 36, almost 37 quads, according to, to Lawrence Livermore, of energy, petroleum flowing through 26 of that, uh, and really 28 total for transport. So one of the other big changes is what's happening with transportation. And I think we're gonna have to understand that because as we electrify and thrive, and we'll talk about that in a bit, it's gonna be a big chunk of new energy that we're gonna to have to find. Not just replace the old fossil, but find new energy to even serve that. Next slide, just to kind of give you some context for those non-energy, how big is a quad of energy? So remember the United States uses about 100 quadrillion BTU, 100 quads. The world uses about 450 quads of energy. So think about it this way, look at that second point. One quad, of, you know, this is from Wikipedia, but 8 billion gallons of gasoline. Um, it just shows you the scale of the energy system in the United States and globally. Um, one quad of energy comes from about 13 tons of uranium. So 
you know, these are, are even, you know, for people in the industry, these are numbers that are just so immense. We have to keep thinking about that as we go down this, this change and we think about this change. And it's absolutely key to understand it because that's what it's going to take. The investment that's needed, the change that's needed, the efficiency that needed is going to be dramatic. And if we're going to make it work, we're going to have to really work together as an industry to achieve it. Next slide, Andreas. So what forces, I'm going to just walk through, and I'm going to do this relatively quickly. I'm happy to come back later again. You can find me on LinkedIn or, or you know, through, through Andreas. But what are what I say the big forces? So, of course, we've talked about it, decarbonization, Andreas. Next slide. So just to put that in context, this is a, a really good map, a good summary of states. I know that we have, you know, as a, a very unique model, the American model, much of climate action is taking place at the state level, even down to the municipal level. But you can see 32 states are already working aggressively on their own action plans. Each state is, a, is, is sort of leapfrogging their competitive states to try to move ahead. Some states haven't done it, although, you know, my home state of Texas while there's no specific plan, there was an RPS generated when we restructured the industry. And I think the market, and that's the other piece that I think we're gonna talk about more and more, the market is pulling and consumers are pulling. And I think we can all chat as we get to this panel that consumers are gonna pull us further and faster as it relates to decarbonization. Next slide. Next one is digitization. Digitalization, real quickly, Andres, next slide. So, this has been a real big opportunity, and I think it's an underutilized opportunity as ACEEE has found. So there's 100 million smart meters in the United States. And as we go from an analog world to a digital world, it's not a simple change, it's a dramatic change. Unfortunately, you know, in the last point I make that out, groups like Mission Data would say, and I've, I've lived this at Direct Energy and NRG, not all smart de meter data is the same. And basically, it's not the same because we're not able to access it and help our customers use it effectively and efficiently. And I think we really, as an industry, need to have a conversation with our regulators, uh, with our consumer advocates, and make sure that technology firms, retail energy providers, uh, creatives, the technology players, can get access to this data so we can, in fact, utilize it and send real signals and control things the right way at the right time. Next slide. Decentralization, if you just jump ahead again. This is, the world has changed. Uh, Sam Insel would have thought about building bigger and bigger centralized units as we set up the industry. This shows sort of the growth of solar uh, at the residential level, PV installations. And while it's dramatic, from 2010 of 200 megawatts up to about almost 3,000 megawatts in 2019. Again, if you think about the US electricity grid of needing about a million megawatts, we really have a long way to go. This is great growth, and I think the industry is doing a fabulous job, but we're gonna have to figure out a way to go even faster. Declining, um, next slide. And this is, again, declining cost of renewables. You can see these numbers. You can see where the, the, the gray bar at the bottom is sort of the cost of levelized cost of fossil fuel. And you can see most of these uh, renewable resources from biomass to wind, but on and offshore to solar, is now by 2025 going to be very, very competitive and not to be able to displace. And those renewables uh, and the declining cost create a huge opportunity. That, coupled with, with storage, I believe will be a game changer. I think we'll be probably talking about that a little bit more on the panel today. Next slide. Dominance, if you flip again. So what this is one that probably is not as well received, but natural gas has grown, um, grown dramatically, specifically in the use in the power sector. You can see just recently in July of 2020, we used 47 BCF one day to power our electricity grid. Uh, this goes from, you know, just back in the 70s when we thought as a society that natural gas was too premium of a fuel to burn in power plants. We're now powering it, and it's global too. If you flip to the next slide, this is a wonderful picture. 
and the darkening of the purple from 1992 to 2019. So you can see in back in 1992, only a few countries around the world were materially developing and using natural gas to power their electricity sector. Those, of course, that were naturally long, the United States and, and uh, Russia. But you can see in 2019, with the rise of LNG and sort of local uh, production around the world, more and more countries are using natural gas. And while it is not uh, a carbon-free fuel, it is significantly enhanced, recognizing that there's still issues uh, in terms of how methane is released and its climate impact. Next slide. Drive, and I think we talked about this a bit, but again, real quickly, drive is not just EVs. We think about drive and we think about the forces of drive. Clearly, we need to electrify our transport. We talked about that huge green bar of energy consumption on the, on the petroleum line. So we're gonna do that, but it's also electrifying everything else in the home, in the offices. And this is gonna take some really, really hard thinking. How do we change both the appetite of consumers to use natural gas or use electricity in certain things? And how do we think about the cost effectiveness of electricity sort of inside the home? And if, you know, if we need high pressure steam at a refinery, how do we think about that and what's the right vehicle? to provide that to these big industrial firms. The other piece I'll throw you in, well, again, while there's rapid growth according to this chart, you know, it's my understanding, you know, when I look at trend lines, there's about 250 million automobiles in the United States. So while we're getting close to a million, the scale of this is enormous. The opportunity is enormous. And I think that's why you're seeing lots of people talk about who's going to best serve the growing EV market. And how does this change our economy? Uh, how does this change uh, people's lives? Uh, but it's a huge opportunity. It's very hard to do. Uh, next trend, dull and dynamic. Flip to the, the page, Andres. Um, if you look at the top chart here, this is sort of oil domain. And again, I'm talking about the energy sector writ large. We'll talk about utilities in just a second. Since 07, oil demand in the OECD countries has basically been flat. You can see there's, of course, the end here where we've had the, the pandemic causing disruption. But this is true for power. This is true for most uh, sort of final energy products. We're just not growing top line volumes, which makes all of our businesses uh, harder. Uh, because if you don't have that top line growth that's coming from the rent large economy, you have to work harder to think about where you're going to grow as a business. On the other hand, in the non OECD countries, you see a dramatic increase in the use of oil around the world. And I think this is true and even more so for power. And I think we're gonna to have to address these questions of decarbonization and growing energy in the dull North OECD world and the dynamic non-OECD world. And how do we think about that? Making sure everyone comes along so they can have clean, smart, affordable energy. And finally, I think the, the key, and what I would say the key driver, the key trend, it's what I call design, if you just flip to the next page. My belief is that all of this transformation is accelerated and made more efficient when we give consumers more control. And I believe consumers like choice, and I believe consumers make the right choice. Um, the one thing, and this is, a, this is what we, we have a, in Texas where we have a retail, a vibrant retail energy market. This is really, there's an independent group that puts out and, and calculates net promoter score, you may have known, and net promoter scores a Bain uh, number, which sort of asks the question on a scale of 10 to zero, would you recommend your provider? And sort of gives you a positive score, a negative score. You can see that, again, in a place like Texas where the market is relatively mature, where consumers have choice, the range of promotion of different providers is exactly what you would expect, and it, and it drives people to produce more value for their customers. So as we think about this revolution, this transition, this disruption, I think we have to continue to remember that consumers want choice. They want the right to design their own path. They want the right to fire their supplier if they're not getting the services they believe because they will treat us uh, um, both positively 
and negatively if we deliver. Okay, so again, real quick, next slide. Uh, decarbonization, digitalization, decentralization, declining dominance drive dull design. We always talk about those first three, decarbonization, digitalization, decentralization. The forces in the energy world, I think, are broader, and I think we have to continue and think about those and how we're going to set it up. Let me jump now. Go to the next slide, Andre. Thank you. So the final part of the agenda I'm going to go through, and, and, um, and I'm really looking forward again to the conversation. The final part is sort of the right direction, my belief, the right direction for utilities. And I just want to reiterate something I said early on. Um, the utilities, the way I see that, are really the cornerstone of our modern life. I mean, there are people in Louisiana today without electricity. A couple of weeks ago, we had, we had issues with power outages in the Northeast because of their weather event. Um, I fundamentally believe there is a core and, and meaningful role for utilities for for uh, as long as I can see forward. In fact, we need the utilities and the regulators that oversee the utilities and the policymakers, and I, I look forward to the conversation about that, to really help direct the utilities, to go back to that Alice in Wonderland quote, to, to choose where we want to be, and then guide the utilities to help us get there. Um, and it's gonna be absolutely key that we're giving clear guidance to these utilities uh, to our partners because they are the platform in which everything is enabled as we electrify our economy and clean up, clean our economy and decarbonize our economy. Next slide. So, so what really are the questions as I think about it? Um, and, and so these are the four questions and Tom may have some different ones, but here's how I see it. You know, really as I think about what do consumers really want from the utility, from their energy providers? Um, and then what's the right response from utilities to those new needs and wants? Our policymakers and our regulators, our, our political leaders, our, our, our advisors, are they helping or hurting utilities and therefore consumers in getting the right products and services to the market? Are they allowing utilities to do what makes sense and let other people do the right things as well so we can truly serve customers the right way? So we can serve customers on this journey to a decarbonized future. And then finally, with that sort of direction, what are the right frameworks? What models do we need to put in place? What new business rules do we need to put in place? Or are the old tools workable today? So here's my proposal. Next slide. So here's what I would say is we're thinking about setting a direction. Here's the sort of four points I would keep front and center that I would recommend to our industry, to our regulators, to, to my peers and partners around, around the industry. First, we need to put consumers, we must put consumers at the center of every possible decision. They do want to design their path. I've, I've served millions of customers, I've helped numerous businesses find their path, and I know that they all are unique. I know that when I try to be a focus group of one, when I try to dictate the outcome that's right for them, I am often not always wrong. So I believe strongly as we think about transforming this energy transformation, let's remember to put consumers first and everything else positive will follow. Second, I would make the case, and I think this is a, a real conversation that we need to have. We had this conversation in the 70s, we had this conversation in the 90s, and I think we need to restart and reinvigorate this conversation. But I would argue that the right question we need to be asking is, what's the right scope of the monopoly utility? Many, many years ago, again, I, I referenced Sam Insel, when we were establishing utilities, and there were competitive utilities with competitive wires, competitive generation, uh, many, many you know, uh, uh, risks to that. We created an arrangement that said, we'll give you a franchise if you'll make sure, because there was a natural monopoly to develop a generation of time and transmission and distribution, but no longer in many elements of the, the core utility that we would think back to the 70s, is there a natural monopoly? And so I, I think the right answer is to really clearly define the scope of the utility. And I think we should define it as small as possible and no bigger. And there, when we replace regulation in the monopoly utility with competitive markets. I think it's absolutely key 
that we make sure there's excellent oversight and that we enable and engage consumers differently uh, or, or the industry differently through regulation and oversight. And that's key and it goes back, you know, this is, California has had a number of issues this year in their energy markets. And, and I remember back to the day when there wasn't good oversight in California's energy markets. I think markets can work extremely well when allowed and when given good guidance. And finally, I'll make the final point, which this may, this may be interesting to hear my, my fellow panelists conversation, but you know, many, many times we're trying to create the perfect regulation uh, sort of how do we change the regulatory framework so that we can even provide more service to utilities or utilities can operate in a better manner. And I, I'm going to go back and sort of, you know, um, say that I think we already have the right tools. I think cost of service regulation is appropriate, allows utilities to recover and be given a fair return uh, and set fair rates and service. And I think often when we try to create that perfect regulatory model, uh, PBR, or some very detailed IRP, and some other programs that may sound great and that we want to do, I think we end up losing sight of the, the larger issue, which is it's a scope question, not a model question. Final point on that, and flip the slide. You know, this is, you know, the, the um, next slide, Andres. Um, you know, Voltaire said this many years ago, the best is the enemy of the good. And Sir Robert Watson uh, Watt also said this. He, for those that don't know, he was the father basically of, of uh, uh, radar and really was instrumental uh, in thinking about radar and helping uh, Britain win the Battle of Britain. And, and his quote, which I think is, you know, give them the third best to go with. The second best comes too late in the best never comes. And so as we're again thinking about the framework of how we oversee the residual monopoly, I think this is very wise words for us to end on. Um, one final slide, next. And I hope it's not time running out and you can't see this, in, in, in our, but I'll read the two quotes. Um, I I'm a, love to look at Twitter early in the morning with a cup of coffee and always see what the experts have um, thrown out overnight. There's some amazing thoughts from, from people. And, and it was just an interesting, a couple of weeks ago, it was early in the morning having a cup of coffee, and these two tweets were sort of juxtaposed. The, the lower one, um, let me read that. He says, a warmer, and there's a picture below it in Seville, Spain, which is there was a thunderstorm and, and water was rushing over and destroying some some streets and some things. A warmer atmosphere holds more water. A warmer climate brings more intense storms. Most of our infrastructure was built for the climate of the 20th century. Most of that infrastructure is still around and will be around for many more decades. We aren't built for this yet. Right above that in my Twitter, you know, I don't think you know, how this happens, I don't know, but um, Senator Murphy from Connecticut was had been having issues of course with his um, uh, uh, utilities because of the weather event they had and he, his quote was i spent the morning on the phone with eversource ceo jim judge i told him it was time for policymakers to examine the future of for-profit utility monopolies with big rate hikes and a week without power is the benefit of a publicly traded electric company worth the downside to me these two kind of uh, alternative, both similar but different views of this. As we saw, the, the, the scale of our change is dramatic. It's immense. It's enormous. We are going to have to figure out a way to work together to make this as, as one industry, as both an energy industry and a utility industry. But to see this conversation where we know the infrastructure we have, well, wooden poles across the United States, uh, aging assets on the power stations, um, less than necessary transmission, uh, a water next energy nexus that we're going to have to have a, a real robust conversation about, uh, land use questions. And my belief is that for-profit utilities are a key part of that future so that they're providing the platform to make it capable for us to do what we want to do for consumers to design their own path. 
So I just throw this out that it was just for me uh, as I was working on this and talking to Tom that this came out and, and we have a lot of work to do because we're gonna have to figure out how do we engage policymakers to allow the utilities to succeed so that consumers can go where they want to go. And with that, uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Jim. That was uh, brilliant. I think the juices are flowing. Uh, the questions are being formed in everybody's head. I encourage everybody to do so electronically and be and look out for my interaction electronically to help you that make that happen. Let me introduce your moderator, and uh, he will take it from here. Uh, Tom Rose is an old friend, a great friend. Uh, he's a business partner. He's um, one of those um, superstars that play a significant role in the deregulation market of Texas with people like Pat Wood, if you know Pat Wood the third. And uh, needless to say, he's now working uh, together with us here in uh, CMG as a principal and uh, running the show on the regulatory design practice and many other things. And, He's uh, having a blast and having a good time. Uh, he's uh, just uh, put together this panel and we're looking forward to it. So Tom, take it away and um, have, take as long as you like. If you wanna take five, minute, five minutes over, if the conversation is flowing, keep going. You bet, we'll keep it, we'll keep it up and rolling. And thank you, Andreas, and thank you, Jim. Uh, I would have to say you gave us a lot of food for thought and a lot of uh, things to discuss and topics to go over. So I appreciate that. That's the purpose of a good keynote. So thank you very much. And uh, in a minute, we'll give y'all a chance, everybody a chance to ask questions of Jim and we'll start the questioning. But I'd like to start by giving you, each of you a chance, a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and more importantly, your company that you're working for and what you're doing in that company. And uh, why don't we start with uh, Susan? You want to jump in and talk to us about Exelon a little bit? Sure. So really happy to be here, and thank you for including me. I'm, it's an impressive panel. I'm happy to be on it. Um, I am Director of Utility Initiatives at Exelon. Uh, I work in Exelon Utilities, which branches across all of our operating companies in the electric and gas utility space. So. You might know these, if you're outside of Texas, you might know these. Um, I don't know if inside Texas you do, but it's ComEd in Chicago, uh, Pico in Philadelphia, um, Delmarva Power, which is Delaware and Coastal Maryland, Atlantic City Electric, which is Southern New Jersey, um, Pepco, which is Maryland and the District of Columbia, as well as Baltimore Gas and Electric, which is obviously Baltimore and Maryland. So we are in all restructured markets. We, have, we are in markets where pretty universally, you could say that our customers and our um, policymakers are very ambitious about clean energy, about playing a very important role in, in addressing climate change and carbon reduction. And we're very excited to help our customers and our communities meet those goals. In Exxon, you know, we are, um, we're, we're absolutely committed to putting the customer first, kind of the way that Jim was talking about having a customer centric approach. I think there's a couple of things that were in Jim's comments that I hopefully we'll get into about what is it that customers really want and how do you put them first and so forth. I will tell you that in, um, in our experience, some of the challenges that we face may be different than in other parts of the country and restructured markets, utilities have some limitations on their ability to directly uh, own and operate DERs. And so there are regulatory challenges around that. And there are challenges around utilities role in that DER world. We have challenges in our service territories um, that are very densely populated in the actual siting of DERs in some cases. So we don't have a lot of roof space available in a lot of our jurisdictions at this point for additional solar. And so we have to challenge with those kind of physical challenges. Um, the economics of the ER are still, prices are declining, but there are still challenges there. And that's where I think our conversation is really important because one of the things Exelon is very committed to is working with the developer community to think about new business models that allow us and the developers to tap new value streams to make DERs more affordable 
um, to start thinking about DERs, not only as things for that individual customers, be they residential or commercial invest in, but that we can invest in as communities for grid purposes as well. And that takes a lot. It takes a lot to do the planning and so forth on that. So that's where we're coming from and looking forward to the conversation. You bet, Susan. Thank you very much. John, do you want to jump in next? John Wellinghoff, former FERC Commissioner, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. And uh, we really want to thank uh, CMG, Andres, and all the sponsors for having me on this great panel. And Jim, thank you for that keynote. That was a great uh, introduction. I agreed with almost everything you said, Jim, uh, but we'll get into <laughs> some of the details there. Um, I'm the head of an international consulting firm called Grid Policy, Inc. Um, we work in the U.S. and Europe and Australia uh, and some places in Asia as well, uh, working with a number of um, disruptive energy companies, companies that have disruptive energy technologies that are uh, working at the edge of the grid um, to try to integrate those technologies in and uh, improve efficiency, lower carbon uh, overall. And I've got companies that go all the way from um, high voltage transmission uh, that are putting in things like flow gates in transmission lines that just, you know, five or 10 years ago, no one would have ever conceived of uh, at very low costs um, in places like the UK where they're able to, for uh, investment of uh, in the neighborhood of $25 million, uh, increase the uh, transfer capability by over one and a half gigawatts in the UK grid. Uh, and then I've got another company working all the way down to the consumer level who has uh, devices that you can plug into your uh, wall socket in your house and tell what's happening in your wiring, whether or not you have a, a fault or uh, some uh, precursor to a fault in your wiring that may result in a fire uh, or other uh, disaster in your home. But the interesting thing about the technology, not only can it sense what's going on inside the home, it can sense what's going on outside the home at the utility's grid as well. For example, it can determine whether or not there's a loose neutral on a transformer outside your house that could cause a fire externally uh, or other type of disaster potentially. So that technology has the potential to actually tell the utility company more about its own grid uh, than they know themselves. So we've, we've got some pretty interesting uh, companies that we're working with and trying to uh, reduce the barriers to the uh, implementation and adaptation of those technologies and try to ensure that the technologies uh, can through proper policies and proper regulation uh, expand and be adopted rapidly. Thanks. Great. Thank you, John. I appreciate that very much. Laura, you want to jump in? Just took over as Chief Renewables Officer with Engie and yes, uh, thank you. jumping right into the fray. Excellent. You bet. Uh, but again, echo the thanks um, for having me. It's a great opportunity to be here. Um, as Tom mentioned, I did just join NG in April of this year, so coming into a new company and a new role in the middle of a pandemic in a completely virtual environment has definitely added to the intrigue um, of taking on a new job, but it's really been a great experience so far. For those that are not familiar with NG, NG is a very large global company that's headquartered in Paris, France, and they have operations in more than 40 countries and more than 170,000 employees worldwide. So a very large company. And just in the last couple of years, they've really announced a major pivot toward clean energy. And they divested of billions of dollars of thermal assets and really began to build platforms of clean energy across the world. And so here in North America, that is by charge is to glow their, grow their renewables platform here. And through acquisitions, they've been very aggressive. And by the end of this year, we will have three gigawatts of clean energy online. So we have grid scale, wind and solar, we have distributed generation and we have storage as well. And prior to joining NG, I built my career over almost 25 years, hard to believe how long it's been um, at Avant Grid Renewables. Um, it's a company that evolved over the years. It actually started as a subsidiary of Pacificorp, a regulated utility. So I started there in 1995, actually as a contract receptionist, um, and ended there just in March of this year. My final role there was their um, president and CEO. So clearly I'm a huge clean energy nerd. Um, I believe strongly in clean energy, but 
cost matters. And I think reliability really matters. And I think that's something that all of us really need to be focused on. I totally agree with Jim that consumers increasingly want clean energy. But just a couple of data points that have really been important for me as I've started to build my career on the clean energy side. Here in Portland, Oregon, we pride ourselves on being green and clean and progressive. And yet when you really look, when the customers have the option on their utility bill to just very, make a very simple election, check a box, and pay just a small premium above the original cost so that they would have clean energy that they're supporting, it, it's a really surprisingly low percentage of customers that actually check that box, which tells me that consumers are very price sensitive and it matters. And we have an obligation to be thoughtful about that piece of it as well. And reliability, when you look at what's happening in California, I love California, I love their ambition. They're a huge reason why I think clean energy got such a boost and we've really seen the cost declines that Jim was also alluding to. But look at the, the wildfires and the rolling blackouts that are happening there you're seeing huge, huge, huge growth in gasoline fire generators that people are being forced to buy so that they have energy at their own homes. So I think there is a hierarchy of needs here where consumers need their power and that's gonna overcome the clean energy component of it if it's not cost effective and reliable. So just wanted to throw that out there as sort of a philosophical basis for my views here and really look forward to the discussion. Reliable, safe, and economic. That's what they want. But Eric, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and Vistra? Y'all are growing you. like crazy. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, but thank you, Tom, and uh, let me echo the thanks of being able to be on such a distinguished panel. I'm very excited about the discussion we are going to have uh, today. We had some, in planning for this, there were some really good discussions as well, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, like Tom said, my name is Eric Pitti. I'm the Director of Public Policy with Vistra Energy. So I'm mostly on the legislative side. I work with the business to look at all of the legislation through all the jurisdictions we are in and determine our response for that. And definitely clean energy has been a, a big aspect. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with Vistra, uh, we are a Fortune 275 company. We're based in Texas. We have retail competition, uh, or sorry, competitive retail and competitive wholesale aspects. We operate in 20 different states, as well as the District of Columbia. We also operate uh, facilities in Canada and Japan. And then we also operate approximately 39,000 uh, megawatts of uh, generation facilities that cross the gambit from solar to storage, to nuclear, to gas, to coal, uh, across 20 different states. Um, okay. I think probably in addition to everything that everyone's already said about kind of where the market's going, I mean, you're probably going to see in the next 10 years more change in the electric industry than we've probably seen in the last 50. I mean, it's a very exciting time to be in this industry. And from Vistra's perspective, I think we're very concerned about making sure that that transition happens in an orderly and um, data-driven way. I, mean, I know there are agendas out there and we see a lot of these plans out there that are putting a date certain of when we want to be 100% carbon neutral. Vistra has a plan of really lowering our carbon emissions by 2050 as well. Uh, but we need to make sure that in doing that, we're not putting the cart before the horse and that we are making sure that we're having a reliable grid that, you know, when we put all of these solar panels and um, wind farms out there that we have the dispatchable resources, whether they're battery, whether they're natural gas, to be able to backstop that so we're not falling into in, uh, instances kind of like what's going on in California now, kind of what Germany found with their Eigewinde uh, program uh, in the last decade where people are experiencing power outages just because we don't have the sufficient technology to be able to handle all the intermittency that's out there. Um, but very happy to be part of this panel and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Eric, and I appreciate that and comments from everybody. And I think the best place to start uh, would be if, uh, does anyone have any questions for Jim at this stage since he kind of took the first shot? Anybody want to jump in? Susan, I'm sure you didn't agree with everything. I'm moving I unmuted myself so I could ask Jim a question. Yes, so, so I agree that one of the justifications for the utility in the past was the natural monopoly. 
and I mean, there is still, I think, a justification for utilities on the basis of natural monopoly. But I guess I have a question for you, and that is, is that to me, a utility is justified not only on the basis of natural monopoly, but on the need to serve all and serve all equally. And that is something that I think we've seen that the competitive market sometimes fails to do. They don't offer necessarily the same products to all customers. Um, because it's just not economic to do so, or there may not be the market enough to drive it. Uh, I think all you need to do is look at the digital divide and what the current situation is with e-learning and e-work and how the experience of this pandemic has been so very different for different people in our communities based on their ability to access broadband. And I think that's because it was largely left to a competitive market to develop access. So do you, do you recognize perhaps that maybe another justification for a utility to have a monopoly is also the fact that all must be served, all must be served equally. You know, we've already heard affordably, safely, reliably, but also equally, and that the competitive market sometimes doesn't do that as, as well or as promptly as it should. Great question. Uh, yeah, no. No, I guess, I mean, just to be frank, no, I don't, I don't see, I guess the, the statement that you made was that competitive markets in electricity don't serve all consumers equitably. Uh, you know, I don't know what equally means because equally means you'd only have one product and that of course denies consumers choice. And I think there's a value in choice. So, to, and, and then I, again, I'm not sure exactly, the broadband and telco references are really difficult because it's more about the distribution, like the distribution system. Do I think, you know, there's a capacity to do during long, long, long distance different than, than electricity. So I don't, I don't use that reference. Um, what I would say is I believe that properly structured markets give all consumers choices that they can find available and attractive to them. And so, I, and again, I, I look in, in a city like Houston and uh, I am a big diverse uh, city um, and I know that all consumers have availability of a range of products. Now, if you're, you know, does that mean that everybody has a micro? No, uh, my own today either. So I'm to making sure that all consumers can receive a range of products and services in a competitive market. So I, I would step back. Now there are times that I think consumers, I will agree with this point that there are times when we need to, um, from a social standpoint, help um, make sure that there are good choices meaning there's good information and that consumers are able to make good choices. But I wouldn't say that that means we need to have a monopoly provide uh, electricity services. Okay. I think that means we have other goals. That's fair. That's fair enough. I mean, not all people are the same. We're all different and we all have different wants and desires. Uh, but we also, to Susan's point, I think, uh, we decided at least in the United States in the thirties, the universal service was advisable, just like we're working on broadband right now, providing universal service. So it may be around the minimum service that's necessary for everybody versus every the additional services they want on top of it. Does anyone else have any comments on that topic before we jump into the first question? Yeah, I, I do, or actually, and actually a question for Jim as well. I mean, I agree with Jim that we really do not need monopoly energy service providers. That is not a natural monopoly. There's no, no need to have those services provided under a monopoly structure. And I think Texas has abs absolutely demonstrated that. Uh, and there's a number of other places that have retail choice as well, but I think Texas has done the best job in the US. But Jim, I'd push back a little bit on one side though, what you said on those areas where we do need to maintain a monopoly potentially, and that would be, I assume you're talking about the distribution uh, services and the transmission services ultimately, and you were talking about regulation and using traditional regulation, cost-based, uh, rate-based cost of service type regulation, as opposed to something like um, performance-based rates, and I'd really be interested 
if you go into that a little bit more, because I really think that the cost of service rate based regulation uh, is broken, certainly broken on the transmission side. We're not getting innovation into high, high voltage transmission because we don't have effective competition. When I was at FERC, we tried to put competition into the transmission, development of transmission under order 1000. Uh, it has not gone the way that we wanted it to go, or at least I envision it to go. And I think we do need more performance-based uh, mechanisms to uh, spur innovation and get more competition even into the uh, development of transmission and distribution. And Jim, before you respond to that, let me just clarify. I wasn't suggesting that I believe that we don't need competitive in the energy supply side. I'm talking about when you look at the suite of new services that a lot of DER developers are offering potentially to the customers. If we're talking about customers' choices at the distribution level at their, in their homes and so forth, um, I do think that we're seeing that if you look at something like the example of this EV infrastructure, that it's not being deployed evenly throughout all communities and that utilities are perhaps more natural at being able to equitably deploy those types of infrastructure and that type, those type, make those types of choices available to all consumers, regardless of how they're being categorized by income or where they live. That's all. Yeah. Oh, oh, and, I, and, I would, and I would absolutely agree that we need equity in the delivery yeah. of energy services, but that equity part portion is a social services function and not a monopoly utility function. If it's a social services function, let the state take care of it. Let it be done under, you know, the state auspices and not under some for-profit monopoly. And, and, and so, I guess two questions there. Susan, you know, I appreciate that, that point. Where I'm at is I would, what I've seen over time, and again, I've, so I've spent my, since mid nineties, and it's amazing, you know, there was a, commentary about California, we need more time of use dynamic pricing, of course. In 2001, they had a long history of conversations in the right in California. Speaking, speaking of broadband, it's because the market provides it. And, and there is so, well, then I would say we need a wire display so everyone has that. Um, if it's going to be running over your cell phone and now we get the mobility, there's a question about affordability, which we need to address as a social question so everyone has access to that. I, I, but I don't think creating another uh, element of the natural monopoly or the monopoly is the right answer. John, I, on your point, I would separate transmission and distribution because I, I'm with you. I, I think you your direction around competitive transmission makes a lot of sense and maybe storage provides a little bit more. I'm that I think that's a separate Jim, you're you're kind of breaking up on us, Jim, and I I'm gonna direct it towards some other folks at this point. Your you could signal's have a whole breaking conversation up on us a little bit. Uh, so you know, Laura I I uh I don't know if you want to weigh in on this particular topic of monopoly versus competitive services or not, but uh, you or Eric, but feel free. Sure. I just, I was going to make an observation that I think is obvious, but it's important. When you, even just back when I started in the industry in 1995, I distinctly remember when we would have power outages and it was kind of inconvenient, you know, you had, it was a little harder to read your copies, but the day went on. Today, the power goes out, people just sit and stare at each other. There is absolutely nothing you can do anymore if the power goes out. And I think increasingly, not just in business, at home, and now that we're all living in our homes, our electric access is so key that the stakes are a lot higher. 
than they used to be. It's not just an inconvenience anymore. You literally can't function. Our society comes to a standstill in a, in a real hurry. So I do, Suzanne, I think it's a really compelling question that you asked. And I'm a, I'm a big pro-market person. I think overall markets tend to really do a much better job of you know, providing incentives and then kind of sorting out the natural winners and losers. But it, it is, it's something, that's a compelling question. I, I really appreciated that, that perspective. You bet. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Eric, you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, I mean, everyone's done a really good job in kind of outlining how, you know, kind of complex some of these issues are. And we would agree that you know, there is definitely a role for the monopoly utility structure in kind of the making sure there's a reliable, resilient grid and making sure that the infrastructure is robust enough as these new technologies come on, like the EV charging infrastructure or solar panels to make sure that, you know, as people adopt these technologies, we're not having constraints in trying to get power to them. So there's definitely a role there, but uh, definitely agree with the idea that once you get the infrastructure in place, the actual services themselves, whether it's EV charging stations, whether it's solar panels, all of those sorts of things are best supplied by the competitive market. And I think that's kind of the distinction of the roles as we see it as one is there to um, ensure reliability and resiliency of the infrastructure while the other one is there to really deliver the services that people want. And I'll jump in there just with an example. And Jim, uh, uh, and we all worked on this and saw this happen in Texas when we opened the market and, and started working on market redesign in 1999 after SB7, we actually started in 95. Uh, we thought that, that metering was a competitive service. That if you wanted advanced metering, you would go to a competitor and they would put that in. We found out by 2005, two or three years into the market, that, that just wasn't the case. And so we passed legislation that modified, slightly modified the ERCOT model to require the electric utilities uh, like Encore Electric and Center Point and others to install meters on a mass basis. And we installed six and a half million meters in Texas at residential small commercial that had not been installed. So in that instance, it's that scope design that Jim is talking about that I think we need to get our head around and to understand and appreciate is, is there are scope that, that seemingly might look, to Susan's point, might look like a competitive service, but is it really, is it necessary? Uh, and then we've totally dropped the ball, in my opinion, and agree with Jim on this, that we have now all have all this uh, automated data, but it's hard to get the aggregated data uh, in the hands of folks to uh, help sell the products to the customer. So let's talk about the data management issue a little bit. I think that's a good one because it's sort of at that crossroads between the utility and the competitive market. And what do y'all think we should be doing with data uh, as far as sharing that in broader audiences has been proposed uh, and should it be restricted, privacy issues, so on and so forth? You know, I think I'll, I'll kick it off by just saying that I think it depends on the data, what data we're talking about. If we're talking about customer data, um, at Exelon, we believe the customer data is should be under the control of the customer. If the customer chooses right. for us, for their data to be shared, with third parties, as long as we can verify that the customer is making that choice and that that third party will hold themselves to the same standards in terms of data security, data privacy that we do, you know, then we believe it's, it's absolutely customer's choice to share that data. Um, sometimes I think the line between customer data and system data is getting blurrier because an individual customer's um, let's say DERs behind the meter could have system impacts. And so you start getting into this area where I think it's really hard to clearly say there's this data policy for customer data and this data policy for system data. You have to recognize that some of these bright lines that we've sketched in places are getting a lot less bright. And when you think about the criticality of the infrastructure that we're talking about and Laura alluded to, when you start getting into um, access to system data that could be used, you know, 
either intentionally or unintentionally to do harm to the system, then you have to have a different standard than you do for data that is, that is solely about the individual customer. And there it is under the customer's control. So we're, we're working really hard to try to figure out where that line is and to make as much data available for, that our customers would need to be able to make choices and to interact with third parties um, while still protecting the part of the data that ensures the reliability, resiliency, security of the system. I also think it's interesting to share, think about how we, I know at Exelon, we are, we're embracing the idea of having more transparent and collaborative system planning processes and making more data available to third parties so they can start coming up with solutions for our needs as well as for customer needs. And, and I can see that as EVs begin to tie in, we get more EVs, right. we get more rooftop solar, we get more battery systems in buildings and homes. I, I think that data is gonna be essential, not the customer specific data, not my name, number, and serial number, but yeah, but if you're talking about the aggregation of customer-owned assets data. for system purposes, that line between what is the customer's data and what is system data. Right, and so, blurry. Susan, you sort of froze up on us a little bit. I, I guess I would say, ask the question, understanding that that data is needed, what can we, what policy should the government go forward with on the privacy issue? And is aggregated data that can be shared with others okay? Is that a good thing? And how do we go about doing it? Because most state laws I'm familiar with restrict the customer data to the customer. Unless you get their permission to release it, you don't get it. But there are some states that are producing aggregated data now. Jim, you may be more up to speed well, on that one than I am. I, I think Susan makes some great points. Um, but in a, I guess this is where I would go back to is, is Recognizing the utility uh, is a partner to all of the other players in this industry. I mean, it is the, the platform on which, and I think ComEd uses this term a lot, I think Susan, I, you know, but it is the platform on which all of these changes are gonna take place, uh, both, you know, behind the meter and in front of the meter. Um, we, we do need to, stop, and this is always hard for industries with this much capital at risk is, stepping out of our natural positions to find a way to partner and, and work through these questions. I don't think anyone, any legit, legitimate person in this industry from a retail provider to a technology firm, to a utility, to a, a generation developer wants to harm or sort of provide, you know, have customers private information released because they did something wrong. Um, I think we can protect for that. I think we need to be biased, though, again, around consumer centricity and, and sort of the, the, the sort of the Steve Jobs approach, which is, well, you know, we don't need the data because I don't see personally anything I would do with it. Well, that may be true for me, but maybe that's just a narrow look at what I could do. Um, I, I really believe we have to be much more forward leaning on this question. And, and again, 100 million smart meters. Um, which I'm fine with utilities uh, because I think there is some benefit in terms of deployment in data gathering uh, because it is a question of not just running, having a smart meter, but then getting the data back in a way which is usable. But when it is usable, the, the, the partners of the customers, be them retailers and, and competitive or restructured markets or other providers, I think we really need to look at how we can enable these people because again, I always use the term, I want to clean, smart and affordable and reliability is a given. But we have to smarten up this grid. I mean, if you go back to that energy chart, there's an awful lot of energy of the 100 quads that basically falls away in waste. Losses, you know, think about a, a car sitting in a stoplight, internal combustion engine, your radiator is throwing tons of energy off, taking tons of energy off because you can't use all that heat. Um, we need to be able to address that. And the only way we're gonna do that is to, to smarten the network and to give real prices uh, that consumers can use, right? Uh, right. So, so that's kind of my yeah, thought. We need, we need to work on that. We need to work together on that. You bet. And so let's shift over to the idea, and I want to get Eric and John and, and Laura engaged now, over the idea of a digital platform of some kind uh, and who might be, you know, would a Google or 
uh, Amazon or somebody like that be good at providing that digital platform, uh, pulling that data from customers uh, into an aggregated form. What's your thought on that, Laura? I mean, y'all y'all do a lot of residential and small commercial and uh, solar. Uh, was that data valuable to you? Yeah, I, I think data is so valuable and that's why I think it's become so front and center in such a hot debate right now because the value is so clear. We're also seeing a huge shift in just how consumers are interacting with the system and the grid and it used to be that the generation was the fixed part and it was the load that was moving around, right? Well, now right. the generation's becoming more intermittent with the clean energy sources, and we're starting to see technology and the necessity to really make the load side be the flexible part and the interactive part. And I, for, from my perspective, for the most part, I mean, and it's a balancing act and it's tough because data is valuable and it's you know people's data. I do think if you are, if consumers can see the benefit of the of allowing that data to be shared again not your name and your social security number sure. but just how you fit into the operation of that grid it'll it'll benefit them and if they can see the benefit my sense is going back to kind of Susanna's piece if they check a box saying yes I'm allowing you to share my data I think they'll see the benefits there and I think I, I think we can get past this I do yeah uh, Eric what's your thoughts on the data sharing no, I, everyone's absolutely correct. Data is becoming a more and more important part of all of our lives. And I mean, we definitely see that the, you know, agree that data should be in, con the customer should control their data, whether they want it shared uh, with other third parties or, or how they want it used. Um, but there definitely should be, in terms of the customer protections, there shouldn't be varying customer protections depending on how the, who the data is shared with. I mean, if you think about the kind of the progression from the regulated monopoly to today, right? It used to be only the regulated monopoly had the data and it was really easy to control all that. You had just had to put in controls and you know, make sure people didn't hack into your system. And that was pretty good. And if you needed to share it with third parties, you would send a little thing to whoever owned the data and say, do you want us to share it with you know, our partners? And you know, pre pretty simple. When Texas, using Texas as an example, went into a competitive market, you added in generators and rep, uh, retailers, and now all of a sudden you now have kind of three areas where the data can flow to. You know, you have generators, you have the wires companies, you have the retailers. And now even more beyond that, you have these new parties, new players in the market who aren't even retailers. You know, it's like the solar cities who are helping to put the uh, distributed solar systems on top of people's roofs who are wanting to be able to access data or uh, you know those companies that are helping you determine is my roof even good for solar you know those sorts of aspects and so now you're starting to get more requests for data so you need to make sure the secure the make sure the customer's protected and at the same time make sure we're able to share it and so it's becoming a much more complex problem right well, definitely we're yeah, and we see that in the uh, um, telecom business and the smartphone business and the Google business. And John, I want to jump in and get you because I'm seeing my data shared on my cell phone with everybody, yet the electric industry has protected and consumers have protected their own interest in keeping that data secret to them all these years. And most laws, as you well know, have that customer data protected. Um, how, do, how do we reconcile the, polit the politics of people wanting security and safety for their data with the reality that there is no, there is no closed data anymore? I mean, I, my data is, is available to just about any researcher who wants to get it from my cell phone usage. Well, and, 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 and truth, there's technologies that are available now that you can, in fact, get consumers' data without their consent from an electric system. I mean, right, you know, there's, there's companies a long time been able to get the data out of generators without ever 
contacting the generator or having any interface with them at all, just, you know, being out underneath the wires, you know, hundreds of yards or more away from the generator and putting up a sensor and detecting it and sending that data out to traders to determine whether or not that generator is generating right. at that period of time or how much. So all that technology is available and can be scaled down to consumer level. So from a practical standpoint, you know, individual consumer data uh, is probably, you know, it can't be technologically protected. But on the other hand, I agree with Susanna and Eric and the rest of the panel that, you know, consumers, you know, ideally should control their own data, should have the right to tell um, their energy provider who they want that data to go to and who they don't want that data to go to. But, you know, the lines are starting to be blurred and we do really need to ultimately start sharing that data, at least in aggregate, with a number of entities. Certainly um, at the ISO level, uh, those entities need to know what's happening behind the meter. They need to know, you know, with respect to not only loads, but also with respect to, you know, generation, solar generation on your roof or whether you have batteries, et cetera, and how you're using those. Ideally, you know, in aggregate, that uh, wholesale uh, grid operator should be able to understand what's happening at the distribution level and somehow we have to be able to aggregate that data and effectively utilize it in ways that can provide services out to the grid uh, in aggregate and also provide data out to the grid as well to maintain reliability. Like the blackouts in California, I mean, were primarily due because due to the fact because California didn't have an effective program in place with respect to demand response and respect to load flexibility and ensuring the consumers, number one, they had data about consumers' activities, but also that they could provide consumers with, you know, the proper market signals and the proper incentives to, in essence, contribute to that reliability. And that was part of why the reliability failed overall. So, you know, there is a need to better aggregate this data and utilize it in ways that we can make the grid more reliable and more cost effective. You know, yeah, if I, I could actually, add, I, I totally agree with John in that, in terms of the need for bi-directional data flow. I think that's one of the things that frequently we talk about the data that is needed by the developer community in order to come up with products to offer to customers to allow the customers to meet their energy goals. I think, you know, interestingly, one of the things when we got into a deep discussion on system planning at the distribution level and how NWAs would be considered, one of the arguments that we had to put forward is, is that there needs to be more data sharing in a bi-directional level. So consumers are very ready to share their information with third parties. It, you know, if they're, if they're the type of consumer who's, who's probably got DER, then they're ready to engage with third parties on things like energy efficiency programs, demand response programs, so forth, and share their data to enable that. There, there seems to be some hesitation about also sharing uh, data about the actual operation of things they have behind their meter with their utility. And I think as we're getting more and more into some of the challenges of balancing load and supply at the distribution level, that need for the utility as the system operator to be able to access bi-directional information flow is, is absolutely essential. And we're getting some of that through the smart metering, but it also needs to be, in, in, I think, in a, in a richer level, you know, when we start talking about the amount of things that are going to start being active behind the meter. Well, I, I think those are all great points. Anyone else that want to jump in on that one before we switch gears? Okay. Well, I, I think the, the next step is let's look at the business models we think will be successful over the next five to 10 years. That's, that to me is part of what we have to deal with. And, and I think regulators, if we have good business models, I always start with that on policy because if it's not a good business model, which means you can attract investors with it, it actually produces a service that customers want and it's then there's the companies are successful then you're not going then then regulators typically are okay with those type of services unless they're hurting somebody so what business models and we'll just start laura i, I want to start with you on this one but what business model do you see surviving and, and flourishing over the next five to ten years in the uh, power or energy business i think we're 
we're, we're moving in the right direction, I think. I mean, we're starting there. I think consumers are making their, their needs and their desires known. You're starting to see states, you know, really step up with incentives. I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a pro-market person because I do think those tend to be more efficient and I think they're also more closely aligned with consumers and their needs. And it's also a way to ensure that you set the right structure and the right signals. A lot of it really goes down to price signals in my mind. You really need to make sure that you have proper incentives and that you set up structures that are pricing the things that are important. So if reliability is important, which clearly it is, flexibility is important, scarcity is important, you need to have structures in place that reward the entities for providing the things that the system needs when the system needs it. And you see some really successful models of this in the North, in the Northeast where it's kind of, you, you get paid for performance. And if you overperform during areas of real system need, then you have an opportunity to do really well in those areas. And I, I think that ultimately is what is going to get us where we need to be in the most cost-effective manner. Okay. Uh, Eric, you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with Laura more. I mean, the, business models that are going to do best in the future are going to be the ones that are the most flexible and are also most responsive to what customers want and are able to supply those those things. So um, I, I think that means basically competitive markets are going to, I hope, flourish going forward. Uh, and we'll see a lot of good innovative products coming out of that that allow you know, things that we didn't even realize we wanted, you know, today, you know, 10 years from now, because who would have thought about the iPhone when, you know, telecom was deregulated and, you know, who goes around without a smartphone in their pocket today. Great. Appreciate that. Susan, you want to yeah, jump in? Um, you know, a lot of the business models that we're looking at are in the area of partnering with, with different asset owners and operators. And, one of the things that, that we're spending a lot of time kind of exploring, there's a pilot program in Maryland, is something that, you know, 10 years ago, people were hesitant about the idea of decoupling and disconnecting utility revenues from the volume of electricity that was being sold. And now it kind of feels like, number one, it's a no-brainer if you're going to incent energy efficiency in DER. And to be quite honest, in a moment like this that we're in right now, where load is 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 so low and unexpectedly low, you know, from utility too, there's benefits to decoupling beyond just our ability to be indifferent to being able to offer our customers things that we need in the clean energy space. Um, I think that we're gonna need decoupling 2.0 eventually where we have some disconnection between straight revenue on the utility side from the investment in assets. And, and, and making, um, it's gonna require new revenue models as well as new business models. So we're looking at different business models, for instance, in the use of non-wire alternatives to address grid needs. You know, whether it's a utility-owned DER or it's a third-party owned DER, how can we maximize the value of that DER asset so that we can use it as a grid asset, it can be used in the wholesale market, it can be used in different places, and who's the right person to do all of those transactions so that ultimately, the customer is the one who benefits. That you know those those revenues that are generated in different uses of that DER asset are used to reduce the cost of the system to to the customers. So for us, one of the things that it's not it's not just a talk a discussion around business models. It's also a discussion about revenue models and regulatory <clears throat> models that has to happen right in line with it. Because to be quite honest, as much as I would love to say the utilities are going to jump forward with all sorts of new business models where different different entities than the utility can own assets. I don't think most will do it unless they have some clarity on how they're going to make revenues in that new kind of a world. So can we earn contracts the way we would on a hard asset? Can we, you know, can we earn on savings that are derived from using someone else's asset instead of investing in one directly? So I think, you know, the business model conversation from our perspective has to be married with the, with the revenue model. And, and regulatory model conversation. Right. And that does get into PBR and some of these other things that people think are arcane and complicated, but you know, they are important. Uh, and they're, they're gonna be coming more important. Jim? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's the second time somebody said PBR and I never got to answer uh, John's question from earlier. Uh, again, I, I honestly think, and, and Susan used the word clarity, I think we have to give some certainty 
you know, capital, no matter how great it is, if there's not certainty that there's a market, then their capital won't come. And so right. I, I, again, I come back to the fundamental business model question of what's the scope of the, the residual utility. I think we need to answer that. I think John hit on something early and I, uh, you know, distribution is one thing. Uh, I think transmission is something else. I think we really need to have an industry-wide conversation about how we're going to look at transmission. I think this, I'm going to throw it out. I think, you know, many, many years ago in, in the 90s, we talked about transcos and transmission companies being uh, unique and distinctive from any other segment in about part of the value chain. And I think we should have that conversation and think about what that would look like because building uh, long, long life, uh, multi-jurisdiction assets be it natural gas pipelines or, or high voltage transmission is getting harder. And in fact, the unfortunate reality as an industry in this transformation, we need more of that. So we need to have that conversation that I think John and, and Burke are, are trying to have and, and think about that separate from the distribution wires. And then, you know, if the residual utility, and, and I, I would agree with something Susan said, and I think your utilities in Illinois have this, and I think we have to recognize this. The utilities, the model of the utilities is they only make a return for shareholders if they deploy capital. And, you know, that, you know, is that to change? I think, again, going back to my enemy is the, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good. I'm not, I would rather just live with cost of service, but I would be willing. And I think, I think Illinois and Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, has started to have a conversation where SaaS solutions, where using other people's technology on a, a normal monthly invoice, uh, and how do we reward the utilities for doing that and making a better choice? Why should they be building data farms when they can go to AWS and have the same capacity to store and process data, but it's, it's not appropriate for their shareholders? And I think we need to be thinking about the business model of, and, and Susan, tell me if I'm wrong, but we need to be thinking about how do we let the utilities operate in a world the rest of us operate, which is SaaS-based solutions, but they don't can't help their shareholders when they do that. Yeah, so that I mean, I think I think you're spot on. on, and I do think that there is activity. I'm not an Illinois specialist, but I do believe there's activity on the whole idea of cloud computing as as a service, and how would the utilities be able to access cloud computing as a service, and what's the revenue model under that? I think it goes broader than just those types of examples. I do think that ultimately. Mm -hmm. If you want to have the, mo the most efficient use of assets, you need to recognize that assets can be, hold can be owned by different parties and different combinations of those asset ownerships is, is going to give you efficiency. And so we need to start thinking about, you know, in, in a service economy, a contract is like an asset. It doesn't need to be something, and we have this already, we recognize this to, to some degree with demand response and such. I think we need to start expanding our understanding around that idea of, you know, a contract for a service that replaces an asset should be treated like a hard asset from a revenue right. perspective. Right. And I think, I think storage, electric energy storage is probably going to drive that train, uh, in my opinion. Uh, John, did you want to weigh in on the business models before we kind of hit our final topic? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to, um, you know, I, I'm not sure I agree with the idea that you simply should pay utility for uh, services and asset as opposed to, you know, um, a, a CapEx investment on hard infrastructure. You should pay utility for being more efficient. Well, if, if I can just trading company and, and Laura may have a view, I mean, what are these, right? There are. If it's more efficient to do that, ultimately to go to the service as opposed to maintain the hard asset, then they should be paid to do what is more efficient to do. But that again, I think comes back to some kind of performance-based structure that, you know, has not been successfully demonstrated any place, I will admit. And we don't have any good models, but that doesn't, we don't need to at least, you know, move towards trying to develop such models because I think we have to become more efficient. We have to reduce costs for consumers and the way to do it is to ultimately ensure the consumers uh, see they're getting value for their money. Certainly, ideally, that's what markets are supposed to do, but I think we have all agreed that 
you know, markets are not necessarily uh, applicable to all, per, all parts of the provision of energy services. Uh, some parts perhaps yes, but other parts perhaps no. So I think there will be continued, there'll continue to be a mix. I think we'll um, continue to extend um, uh, competitive retail services like Texas to other jurisdictions. I think that model will expand. Uh, I think we'll also see an expansion of um, what we're seeing at the wholesale level, and, and that is uh, independent system operators uh, who, will, who will operate those systems uh, independently, uh, absent the underlying owners of the investments, uh, and do that as efficiently as possible. And I think uh, the ISOs have demonstrated their ability to be more efficient than the uh, asset owners actually operating and planning on their own assets. Right. So I, I think that model can be can be also translated to the distribution level. You can have uh, an IDSO, an independent distribution system operator, which I think would put efficiency in the system and lower costs for consumers as well. And manage the two-way power flows. We, we do have a question that's come in from one of the audience uh, and it's around Mexico, the Mexican market. Um, and the, really it, it's what lessons can Mexico learn from US restructuring processes? And I think that's a perfect one for you to start with, John. Uh, what, what would your rec, if you were working with the leadership of Mexico right now, and they're dealing with a lot of difficulty, including over several million people with no electricity at all. Um, do, you, do, you, do you have any thoughts about Mexico? Um, a few, although I, I know a lot more about China than I do about Mexico, uh, I, I have to say. You, John. Uh, can you there hear me you now? Go. Now we can. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, say, I have a few thoughts about Mexico, although I know a whole lot more about China than I do about about Mexico. Ultimately, um, I, I think if, if number one, if you have a large population that is not served, you certainly need to have, I think, you know, a monopoly service and or you know a state uh, as we did in the U.S. with the RUS many years ago, the rural utility service, you know, uh, you need to develop distribution and transmission and, and service provision to those people who are not, not now served. So I think we, we do need to have universal service. There's no question about that. I would, I would you know, I, I would recommend to them that that would be the first place to start. But, but again, I, I, I would uh, recommend that they try to develop a market structure st starting certainly, um, you know, at the at the wholesale level that they develop a, a robust uh, wholesale market ultimately, and that market be across the entire footprint of Mexico. Uh, right now in, in the U.S., we have um, you know six different uh, ISOs ultimately, and uh, I think we should look at consolidating those here in the U.S. because I think if we can consolidate. Uh, the administration of those markets, you can also reduce costs. So to the extent that they can try to consolidate a market administration and oversight, and I agree with, with Jim, you know, when you have markets, uh, they can't be uh, simply, you know, deregulated. It's not a matter of deregulation. There has to be a market structure and there has to be adequate market oversight. And I would, right. I would recommend that to them as well. Right. Uh, Laura, do you see NG trying to go down to into Mexico and doing business down there uh, because there have been some proposals in very remote areas that may have, you know, a few thousand people, but there's not enough to build a new transmission line out there to the system from their central plants uh, building a microgrid. Um, yes, and the NG does people. have, it's not part of um, our business unit, but NG does have um, a business unit and does operate in Mexico. And my previous company also did a lot um, in Mexico, especially as they were moving into their kind of regulated market structure. And I, I think that the key takeaways from, and I think we've been touching on a lot of this here, certainty is really important. If you want people to invest, especially the types of capital that's required for some of these assets, you, you have to have certainty and sanctity of contract, I think are really, really key. Um, and I think right. aligning incentives, which kind of goes back to some of the previous topics here too, under business models, you, you have to have aligned incentives. If you've got utilities that are ultimately on the hook 
for last resort service. They have to have proper incentives to keep that system uh, you know, running and operational. And sometimes that seems counter to what a consumer wants. I'm putting a solar panel on my roof and so I should just be able to generate whenever I want to and then you should pay me when I generate to the grid, which I get that, except that if that solar panel, if you choose not to maintain it or it goes down, you're fully expecting that utility to be your backstop and step up and behind you. And so right. I just think alignment of incentives and just recognition of of the part that all the parties need to play and increased collaboration so that we can all really work toward the most efficient system possible going forward. Okay. Well, we're coming to the end of the, of the call. We're going to continue for a little while, uh, just in case we have some folks that it looks like most of the participants are sticking around for a little while. So uh, let's shift one to um, a policy issue related to energy storage and the use of energy storage to improve reliability, not only on the bulk power system, but out on the edge of the grid and the distribution system. Uh, and the idea that you might be able to use mobile batteries or EVs, electric vehicles, as a source of energy to help uh, produce power during peak periods uh, to keep the distribution systems and the uh, grid up and running. Have y'all thought about that one? I mean, I'll, I'll start off. We've definitely thought about that given the battery legislation that occurred last year in the Texas legislative session. And we definitely think it's an interesting concept. I mean, we, we see, a, uh, you mentioned at the transmission level and the distribution level, and we're also looking at batteries at, um, you know, the generation level as well. We're pairing them uh, with the solar farms that we have here in Texas and with other generation resources, uh, both in Texas and California. But um, at least in the competitive markets, obviously in the fully regulated markets, it's different. We, depending on how batteries are um, kind of defined, personally, we see them as a generation asset. And so that should be a competitive asset. Now we don't have a problem with a utility contracting with a generator to provide that service, but the, the asset itself should be owned by the generator, not the utility. And, and so I'm going to take major a, issue with that one. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think and if you and look Susan, at batteries, the, you know, because battery, battery, if you think of a battery, and I'll just jump in and I'm leading to your question, to your answer, Susan, I'm sorry, but a battery is not a generator. No, it's it not actually low. serves three different purposes. It can be a load sink, it can be a generator, and it can look a whole lot like a power quality management device. Yeah. With that said, Susan, jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, we see batteries, and this was a big issue for us. I mean, we had in Maryland, there was, um, the commission in Maryland wanted to see how they'd be able to incent more battery installation in the state. And I mean, I think their drive there was not only to create a demand for batteries and perhaps a battery installation type of industry, but also to figure out how we can use batteries to the benefit of customers, not only from a reliability perspective, but in terms of cost savings on system investment. And we had a large stakeholder group that included a number of battery developers and so forth um, come together over months and months and discuss what we wanted to do and put forward to the commission. And what we ended up with was a pilot program that tests four different ownership of battery structures in Maryland. The first hurdle we had to get across was this idea of defining batteries as generation, because at some times they act like generation. If you actually look mm -hmm. at batteries, they tend to be net load, um, because you put more into a battery than you can take out, you're gonna lose some over time. But what we came up with was a pilot program that was embraced by a variety of battery and solar developers, um, as well as the Energy Storage Association and so forth that test four different business models for using batter batteries specifically as a grid asset to, to deal with peak load. So the first one allows the utility to own the battery, use it for the grid, and then also use it in wholesale markets with the revenues that are generated in the wholesale market being used not to the benefit of the utility, but to the benefit of customers by reducing the recovery requirement on the original battery investment. The second model is, is the utility owns and operates the battery um, as a grid reliability asset, but then leases it out to a third party for wholesale transactions or other value streams. 
And that lease payment that we get from the third party is used to reduce the revenue requirement or recovery requirement on the battery. The third model is one where a third party owns the battery and uses it for whatever, and then leases it to the utility for its reliability peak management needs. And what goes into the rate base is not the actual battery, but whatever we're paying for that lease payment. And the fourth one is this whole virtual power plant approach where you have multiple owners of smaller batteries. You have either the utility or a third party acting as an aggregator. And the fee that's being paid by the utility either to the aggregator or directly to the battery owners, if it is serving the aggregators, what goes into, into rate base. So we've been working really hard on it. We've got of our three Maryland utilities, we've got six pilots out there testing these different business models. And we're really excited to see what it shows us for which ones work best. Right. Laura, I mean, you guys sell batteries along with all the other stuff you do. Uh, yeah. What's your viewpoint on ownership issue and just how, how best to integrate them into the grid? Yeah, I, I'm really intrigued with the four different business models that Susanna just outlined there. For us as a developer, really where it comes down to, and I'm becoming a bit of a broken record by accident here, is certainty, right? You need revenue certainty. And right now in a lot of the markets, it's wholesale revenue and you have no long-term certainty, and yet the capital investment required and to be able to get approval for this from your parent company, if you're balance sheet financing or if you're getting external financing, that is so important in understanding really what is the long-term revenue stream that you can count on from this asset. And so I think really working with the utilities in, in regulated jurisdictions for things that again, align incentives, they give people the certainty that they need, I think that's ultimately where you're going to get the best benefit for the system. Well, Dan, and you want to Tom, jump in? Tom, yeah, let me add to Laura's comment and, and add to the business models that Susanna uh, outlined for batteries. Another one, you know, FERC actually issued an order in 2011 indicating that batteries can be used as a transmission asset. So if, if, bat if a battery is in fact designated a transmission asset, then there is certainty because it's going to get rate-based cost of service recovery for uh, actually uh, uh, being uh, de de developed and deployed and utilized as that type of an asset. So there's, you know, you know, ba batteries are are so multifunctional uh, that ultimately, uh, you know, it's it, it's somewhat up to the developer to determine how they want to utilize that asset and for what purposes they want to ultimately uh, develop that asset for. And the only comment I would have on that, John, is you can't operate the battery even as a transmission asset without impacting wholesale pricing. Now, I could say that about a lot of transmission yeah. operation, including yeah, that's right. shutting lines down to repair them and work on them. So it's a, it's a complex issue. And unfortunately, we have run out of time, guys. Uh, we've got to shut down in a couple of minutes. Uh, Jim, I'm going to give you kind of the last word since oh. you haven't spoken up lately. All right, well, thank you. Um, look, I want to first again thank Andreas and, and CMG, Tom, you. This has been a great panel. John, Suzanne, Eric, and, and Laura have enjoyed having this conversation. Um, there's a lot here. I think we as an industry have a lot to do. Uh, I think the idea of partnership and collaboration and certainty, as I think Laura said a number of times, is what we need to be driving towards right now. And I, I look forward to the next 20 years as we make this uh, industry cleaner, smarter, and, and more affordable for everyone. That's great. Thank you very much. Andreas? All right, guys. Sorry to cut you off. I know that we can keep going. So we'll bring you back for uh, Digital 360 Summit 2021. Uh, we'll follow up with you. Uh, thank you for sharing today. I'm going to stop recording uh, in the audience.